Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie, this is going to be my new Mandalorian Season 2 Ahsoka Tano video. I'll explain what was happening with her after Order 66, what they've said about her on the show, what her future is on the Mandalorian series and in the Star Wars live action Disney Plus series. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. We'll do a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and post all your predictions for Ahsoka Tano on the video. Careful for spoilers for everything that's happened on the show so far if you haven't seen any of the episodes. But first things first, Friday, the title of The Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 5 has been reported as The Jedi, which is just a general reference to Ahsoka Tano and the enemy sorcerers the Mandalorian and the armor spoke of in the Season 2 trailer, the Jedi that Mando is quested to take Baby Yoda to. Also, it broadly references to the show invoking the lore of the Jedi to the series in a much bigger way. Like the concept of Jedi and the Force are coming to the Mandalorian series in a much bigger way than before. There's still a ton of questions that the show has raised during Season 1 and Season 2 so far about where Force-sensitive characters and former Jedi that survived Order 66 fit into the show going forward. Like how many Jedi are we going to see over the next couple of seasons? Most of those answers will come with Episode 5, or they'll at least give us enough information to provide some context for that. As of the end of episode 4, he's currently returned to his original mission with the directions given to him by Bo-Katan and the other Mandalorians. He's going to the city of Caladan on the forest planet of Corvus. There were a lot of you that asked if Caladan was meant to be a Dune reference to Caladan, the former seat of House Atreides before the events of the first novel or the movie, depending on what you're talking about. The way it appears in the official subtitles of the show, though, it's spelled differently. So I assumed at the time in episode three, when Bo-Katan said that, it wasn't meant to be a direct reference to Dune, but it does sound very similar. Corvus, though, is a Star Wars name. It's the name of the ship that Iden Versio's Inferno Squad uses during Battlefront. That character is still alive during this period in the timeline. So because Katie Sackhoff went from doing the animated version of her character, Bo-Katan, on the Clone Wars and Rebels to doing the live action version, it's always possible that Janina Gavankar could do the same thing with Iden Versio. I know everyone's asking for Cal Kestis to show up on the series now from the Jedi Fallen Order game. Janina Gavankar actually already got a secret Mark Hamill style cameo during episode 3 though, if you can believe it. She played the Mon Calamari Dockmaster here who repaired the Razor Crest. So we'll see if she eventually shows up in a bigger way in future seasons as her Iden Versio character. Pretty much anybody from anywhere in the canon in Legends is totally fair game. If they're bringing stuff from the Dark Forces video game like the Dark Troopers back into main canon, they could do that for anything that they want. Even Mark Hamill had a cameo during season 1 as the EV-99 droid bartender in the Mos Eisley Cantina. You wouldn't have known it was him unless they told you because they changed his voice so much. So pretty much anything is possible. But the Mandalorian is finally going to Ahsoka Tano. They've been hyping her up all year long. A lot of you had questions about how she's going to change the show so fundamentally because she's such a huge character. She's one of the most powerful Force users or former Jedi left in the galaxy after Order 66. And reportedly, Rosario Dawson, who's going to be playing her, signed a pretty big contract with the Star Wars Disney people that cover a bunch of future appearances and potential spin-off series for Ahsoka. So theoretically, there's going to be a lot of live-action Ahsoka in the next couple of years in a bunch of different places. But probably the most important thing in all this, though, is the idea that Baby Yoda will probably never leave the Mandalorian series. And the Mandalorian will always be the main Star Wars Disney Plus series during this part of the timeline, right after Return of the Jedi, but before the events of the new Star Wars movies like Force Awakens or Rise of Skywalker. Mando effectively dominates this stretch of history from a production standpoint with this giant new galactic civil war in the battle for the planet Mandalore that they've been hyping up. There will be multiple spin-offs, but this series will always be the main one until they decide to end the show in however many years, season 5, season 7, whatever. The way Ahsoka is being pitched on the Mandalorian series is a little like Bo-Katan. Really important characters, fan favorites that show up, play a really important role in the Mando and Baby Yoda's character development in the overall narrative of the galaxy, but then they cycle out with Mando going on to encounter other big characters from the Star Wars universe as he continues on his journey. So at the moment, they're really more like important side characters, not main characters. So logically, there will have to be some reason that Baby Yoda can't stay with Ahsoka permanently. Mando is taking him to her with the intent to leave him and then return to his regular life as a bounty hunter and trying to track down the remnants of his former clan, including the armor. She's still alive out there somewhere. 
Then there's also the recent revelation that Bo-Katan gave him, dropping all that knowledge about the way and what that really means in the larger context. Like, he grew up being taught completely different things and values about the Mandalorians than what Bo-Katan just told him. So he's still kind of in shock about that. And she's trying to recruit him as a night owl to join their war against Moff Gideon and retake the planet Mandalore in the Darksaber. So for those of you asking why Ahsoka wouldn't take Baby Yoda from him, even if he tries to take off, I think there's a couple answers to that question. First, there's the immediate threat of Moff Gideon and the Dark Troopers from the end of Episode 4. That tag scene where he asks if Mando still has the asset, talking about the child, and then says, we will be ready for them with his evil smile. Giancarlo Esposito is so good at doing that evil guy smile. We're in the back half of the season, so the plot is starting to pick up the pace, getting crazier and crazier. Moff Gideon will probably show up really soon with the Dark Troopers and try to take Baby Yoda by force. Make as many Jedi references as you want. In that situation, Mando would probably feel obligated to try and protect the child, so he'd stick around for that. To say nothing of Boba Fett showing up to complicate things as well. He's sort of an X-factor this season. We haven't seen him since the end of Episode 1, but we know that he's clocking Mando, he wants his armor back, and he's a bounty hunter by trade. Moff Gideon still has that very large bounty out on the child, so do the easy math on that. Boba Fett will probably show up sometime soon again, too. And there's the idea that Ahsoka herself will recognize the father-son relationship that Mando has with Baby Yoda and how much they need each other, and she'll decide that it's best that they stay together for both their sakes long term. Remember Grief Karga's speech at the end of Season 1, Episode 8? He made this joke about Mando protecting Baby Yoda, and just maybe, Baby Yoda would protect Mando. The armor also referenced that when they were talking about his crest for the mudhorn that she was making him in the finale. From an overall narrative standpoint, that's the main reason the show will always be about the two of them. Like the title of the show, The Mandalorian, doesn't just refer to Din Djarin, it also refers to Baby Yoda because they're a clan of two, as decreed by the armor. That being said though, Ahsoka brings the wisdom of the Jedi to the show in a way we haven't seen yet. Mando still thinks of the Jedi as enemy sorcerers, he knows nothing of the Force, even though he quoted the trademark phrase, May the Force be with you. Ahsoka can just clarify a lot of his misconceptions about the Jedi and give him some guidance and help teach a few things to Baby Yoda. He's already so powerful and so connected to the Force that most of what he does, his abilities, are all instinctual, just him reacting in the moment without thinking about it. And if you listen to a lot of the interviews before Season 2 started, Giancarlo Esposito says that on the show, the way that they write the child, Baby Yoda, is that he has no ego. He's neither good nor evil. He's just full of infinite potential. And it's through his experiences and interactions with other characters like Mando and Moff Gideon that he learns to be good or evil. But talking more about Ahsoka's history, charting the timeline of the Jedi and the Force users after Order 66, the main reason why we're just learning about Ahsoka now on the show is because after Order 66, which they covered in the Clone Wars Season 7 final episodes, they're fantastic if you never watched those. I did a couple videos for those. Ahsoka buries her comrades, then left behind her last remaining lightsaber that Anakin Skywalker had given to her in order to make the Empire think that she had died too, going into hiding like all the other Jedi that survived the Purge. Like a lot of you have been wondering if Cal Kestis will ever show up on the Mandalorian series, he goes into hiding effectively trying to keep it on the DL after Order 66. But right after this happens, she heads to the other side of the Outer Rim territories, away from the main hyperspace routes, to try and stay as off the radar as possible on a planet called Thebeska. There is a book that covers a lot of this part of her history. And as you would expect, even though she is trying to keep as quiet as possible, she winds up getting involved in local affairs, helping people around her, which causes her to have run-ins with more stormtroopers. So she continues to have to jump around from planet to planet in the Outer Rim, never staying in any one place for too long. But eventually, she winds up defeating a Sith Inquisitor, taking his lightsaber crystals, purifying them, using them to create her two new dual white lightsabers that you see her fighting with in Star Wars Rebels. So these are different lightsabers than the ones that Anakin made for her during the Clone Wars. Eventually, Bail Organa learned that she was still alive in the Outer Rim and recruited her into the Rebellion formally before the events of A New Hope. They brought her onto the Star Wars Rebels TV series, and she goes by the codename Fulcrum, just helping the Rebels out. Then just prior to the events of A New Hope, she finally meets Anakin Skywalker again after he became Darth Vader and they have a big reunion battle in the Sith Temple. They'd had visions of each other up to this point, but this is the first time that she'd actually ever met him after he became Darth Vader. 
Later, through some time travel nonsense in the world between worlds, Ezra Bridger saves her and she winds up traveling in time to a few months later during the events of the original trilogy and then goes on Jedi walkabout, communing with the Force and helping locals as she bounces around the Outer Rim territories again. There's really no official canon story for exactly what she was doing day to day or specific adventures during the events of the original trilogy, but I think we'll learn a little more about that from live action Ahsoka on the Mandalorian series and wherever else she winds up showing up in the Disney Plus series. Then right after Return of the Jedi, she shows up on Star Wars Rebels in this post credit scene to take Sabine into the unknown regions to find Ezra Bridger, then a couple years later comes back to the Outer Rim territories and starts working with Bo-Katan again, as she said during Episode 3. My assumption in terms of the future of her character on the Mandalorian series is that she'll keep coming back every season to help out until they have their final battle with Moff Gideon in the new Empire, whatever the new battle of Mandalore winds up being in the final season. I talked about this during my Bo-Katan video last week, but this is the real end game of the show. Make all the Marvel Avengers references you want. We're in the end game now. They finally take the planet back from Moff Gideon and get rid of him permanently. And because Ahsoka had a cameo scene during the Rise of Skywalker and that Voices of the Jedi scene, Dave Filoni explained that she was not dead when that was happening, so there is a really old version of Ahsoka somewhere 30 years in the future. She'd be in her 70s during this period. So that just implies that Ahsoka will not die during the events of the Mandalorian series. Just keep that in mind, regardless of what kind of twists they try to throw at us during the episodes. But post all your Ahsoka Mandalorian predictions on the video. My full Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 5 video will post on Friday. It was directed and written by Dave Filoni. That's why everyone's saying it's the Ahsoka episode. Pretty safe bet. I will do a few more Mandalorian bonus videos this week, so leave all your requests in the comments below. But everyone click here for my new Baby Yoda Dark Troopers video to explain the ending of Episode 4 and click here for my full Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 4 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe. This is the way.